Can you hear me? Is it okay? So I'm really glad that you came out here in spite of the rain. Um, we're going to kick off the stage with Sasha Pallenberg and um, he's going to talk about um, what we can learn from the US blogosphere. So please welcome him on the stage. Thank you guys. Good morning. Well, I try to speak very loud because obviously you know, we kind of have to compete with a couple of other stages. So I'm sorry about the weather and I was almost late. I also can't use my little remote control, which is a problem because I love to walk over, all over the stages all the time. So I'm, I'm still, even though that this is my, I don't know how many hundreds of presentations I did, I'm always kind of nervous. So yeah, as she said already, my name is Sasha Palmberg. Um, first of all, I'm a blogger. These are somehow my data is where you can follow me. And I'm running netbooknews.com. I've been uh, starting that site uh, back in January 2009. It was all about netbooks at that time. Now it turned into a, a mobile computing uh, website. So basically, I'm a tech blogger. And on um, next Tuesday, I'm going to launch my new project, which is going to be Mobile Geeks. And so there will be also a .com version, which is the English one, of course, and a German version. Um, here's a picture of me. I live in Taiwan. Um, that's a picture of the Taipei 101. Um, I'm not that tall, and the, actually the building is pretty tall. That was the former tallest building in the world. Um, that, that, that's where I basically live in Taiwan. I live in the southeastern part of Taipei, um, which is close to the tea mounds. It's got them hot over there right now. We are in the monsoon reason, uh, season, and I think we just got hit again by a huge typhoon. Uh, I also love to live in Taiwan, as you can tell, um, because of the food. Um, that's actually, actually my, my favorite one, uh, which is the national food. It's uh, beef noodle soup. And I also love to live in Taiwan because of technology. Um, this is one of the biggest intersections in the financial district of Taipei. Um, that's a Dunhua. Uh, North Road and um, the Nanjing East Road, the intersection, as you can tell, that's like a 10th floor building and they have like huge uh, advertisement campaigns for HTC and you have uh, Samsung all over the caps. Um, this is um, the entrance or an escalator of the MRT, which is a Taipei subway system, and they are all over the escalators, you have campaigns from, from the local brands, and actually they're changing this once a week. So um, my topic today is what we can learn from the US blogosphere, because um, I'm, 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 constantly, I'm constantly having the, or this impression that outside of the US, blogging seems to be a little bit unprofessional in terms of how much awareness we can create as bloggers. Um, I don't want you to speak English at all, right? You can still stay with your native language. Um, but I would, like to, I would like to talk a little bit about our famous US bloggers. I'm pretty sure that all of you guys know this fellow here, um, Pete Cashmore, the founder of Mac. I think it was a Time Magazine uh, saying in the uh, May issue, that he is one of the most uh, 100 influential persons of the year. Um, this Ariana Huffington, the founder of the Huffington Post, um, she sold her blog network to AOL uh, for 350 million euros. No, sorry, dollars. Doesn't, it's not a big difference anymore, isn't it? Um, Jeff Jarvis. Not only a blogger, also an author. Um, he's running Bus Machine and uh, also one of the contributors to TWIT. Fantastic show. Michael Arrington, the founder of TechCrunch. Not doing TechCrunch anymore. Started to become a VC. Over here we have Paris Hilton, who has been basically defining the world of glamour and fashion blogs. And over here we have Robert Scoble, uh, one of the most popular tech bloggers uh, in the world. But what about European bloggers? So if, if, if I would ask each and every one of you, just name me two European bloggers, um, really European bloggers, not only German ones or Spanish ones or Italian ones, I think we will all have somehow problems to really do that. And it's the same with European blogs, especially when we compare them to, to these huge influential blogs 
like Mashable or TechCrunch or Engadget or Gizmodo, I think we are somehow nowhere. Um, but who fucking cares? Yeah, good question. Um, the problem is, what, what I see in Europe, and also, sorry I'm, that I'm talking so much about the German blogosphere, is that blogs really don't have a lobby over here. Um, every, time I'm, every time I'm visiting Germany, and when people are asking me, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a blogger. And they're asking me, well, how, how can we make money with it? I said, well, by just being a good blogger, right? And by just uh, having uh, good advertisement campaigns on my site, by just creating unique content, right? So still in the awareness of the, of the public, blogging still isn't really a kind of profession, right? While no one would ever ask you how you're making money from being a journalist even though that a couple of journalists are really struggling to make money. Um, the reasons why blogs and bloggers don't really have a lobby in Europe is, well, first of all, corporate media still controls the opinion over here. When you're, when you're heading over to your local Google News page and look it up, what kind of, what kind of medias are showing up on Google News, it's all about corporate media and mainstream media, right? It's very, very hard to really, to really stumble upon some blogs. And then it's mainly in this tech blogosphere. And blogs are goddamn boring over here, right? It seems like as soon as someone is having, an, is having a popular blog, we try to copy them with the, with the same ideas, with the same style, and therefore, we're kind of creating so many duplicates that I just got them boring, right? And I don't want to read um, the tenth news article about a Samsung versus Apple lawsuit, right? Which, which got also copied from a US blog. So um, that's why I think um, European blogs in general are got them boring. There's, there's just no... I wonder if, if we're not creative over here, or if we're not innovative, or maybe we just don't want to speak up or something. And let me give you a couple of examples of, of uh, US blogs who made it even into mainstream media over here in Europe. Oh, well, first of all, of course, all these bloggers did it right. Um, the Huffington Post, I mean, that was, that, that was a, a brilliant idea. Just have like 10,000 of bloggers blogging for you for free, creating millions of articles, and then selling the whole network for $350 million without paying these bloggers. It can't get any better. Well, if you are the founder, not the blogger, of course, right? And that's why I think about 9,000 bloggers um, sued Ariana Huffington um, to, to get some shares uh, of this, of this uh, buyout, of sale. Well, TechCrunch also, also sold their blog to AOL seems like AOL is really buying each and every tech block right now in the US. But I mean, what other business plan do they have, right? AOL is dead as a provider, and he was already dead like 10 years ago. So TechCrunch sold for roughly about $40 million, which kind of brought uh, Arrington into the position of now becoming a, a VC. Um, Boy Genius Report, um, they, they always have a pretty pretty bold uh, subtitle saying that they are the best tech block in the world. Uh, I would doubt that, but, but still, right, just by saying this, it seems that they're really creating some awareness with corporate media. Um, they just sold um, their tech news um, to one of the biggest um, German internet companies, which is uh, One and One. Um, they're running their tech news on their portal. It's called uh, gmx.de, and they're basically just translating Boy Genius Report um, tech news and are contributing it to their own tech channel over here in Germany. And I don't even want to know how much they, how much they have to pay for it. But you know, I, I, I wonder why this is happening, right? This is a German portal. Why isn't a German block there to contribute to this portal? Why do they have to buy content uh, from the US? And their content is goddamn boring. Well, Engadget, of course, um, the godfather of all tech blogs, also part of the AOL network. What a surprise. Um, they have millions and millions of readers uh, each and every month and really nice guys and definitely rocking it in the US. Um, 
Gizmodo. Whenever I stumble upon Gizmodo, I, I, I always keep in mind when they found this first iPhone 4. Um, what, someone, someone sold them an, an iPhone 4 sample that got lost in a bar somewhere in California. Um, but besides that, um, Gizmodo isn't really a blog anymore where I would say, oh my god, they're creating such unique content. But just with this story, they were just able to create so much awareness and to kind of get ahead of Engadget at least for three days again. Let me tell you a little bit about the story of these guys. Um, the Verge launched, I call them, was it like five or six months ago? So basically, all these guys that you can see on this picture are former Engadget staff. Like 80% of, of, of the Engadget crew switched over to, to The Verge. And um, they kicked off a blog like, like from zero to hero and have fantastic content. They're starting their weekly show, like a really weekly show. It looks like Jimmy Kimmel's show, right? Like a, like a late night show. And they have like three or 400 people in the audience. So when, when I see these fellas are at, at the CES show or even at IFA, they will have like five or six people over here next week at IFA. At the CES show, there are roughly about 30 to 40 journalists or bloggers from The Verge. They also have their own stage there. Just to give you an example, um, if you compare this to mainstream media here in Germany, Spiegel Online and Springer together have like three people or four people over there at CES. The, the, the most important show if you're talking about consumer electronics. This just gives you a little idea of how they were kind of outpacing corporate media in their specific niche, right? So all of these guys left from Engadget over to The Verge. Guess what would happen if, for example, 30 people from the UK Times would switch over to The Guardian? How much of, uh, how much of support The Guardian or The Times would give each other for the future? Right? They would never, never link back anymore to these sites. They would never refer to them anymore. And when you see the story between Engadget and The Verge, and you see how many times they're still embracing each other's content, even though, first of all, they're competitors, plus they lost all, almost all of their staff to a competitor. Um, I think that's absolutely brilliant, and it tells you a little bit about the attitude that is going on in the US with blogs. Because what would happen in Germany would pretty much look like this. Um, what I want to say is, being disruptive can definitely help you and support your idea of having a unique block and having a unique experience uh, for your users and especially being different from all the from all those other competitors so how can you how can you achieve this and what can you really do to to be different and to be unique and to be disruptive um, let me tell you a little bit about my story. That was the first website that I launched back in 2001. And it still looks the same, which is kind of embarrassing. I'm sorry, this meets not any, not any standard of modern web design. It's not even running on a, on a fancy um, CMS system. This is still using PHP Nuke, and I don't even know how many times we've got hacked. Uh, but I'm sorry, I just have no time for it anymore. So um, this was... Um, I found my first company in Germany in 2001 because I was pretty, pretty bored and upset with my life. And um, then I got my very first mini ITX mainboard from Taiwan. It's one of these fellas here. It's, it's, it's a little motherboard um, form factor that got invented uh, in the early 2000s. And it's only 70 by 70 centimeters. And I got it out of the box and, th and thought, oh my God, well, that's absolutely amazing because I was so used to these huge and gray and uh, big PCs. And now, out of a sudden, I got something, a new form factor, super small, and I thought, okay, that's the, that's the future. What, what shall happen to the PC industry? Whether they're getting bigger and more powerful and noisier, whatever, or they're getting smaller and with a lower power consumption. So I, I founded my first company. I've imported these products from Taiwan, and um, I, couldn't get a, I couldn't get a credit over here at any bank in, in Germany because this was right after the dot-com bubble. And uh, so I've had no money to, to run any kind of advertisement campaigns. And so I started uh, my own community around this. So I started EPS Center, 
that, that was the very first news site uh, regarding this form factor and regarding this whole scene and this whole community. And therefore, I created my own advertisement channel. But again, you can still head over to this page, epicenter.de. The user experience is horrible. And then we're talking about boring blocks again. But I tell you what, I tell you what this one was super boring. I've been, I've been writing reviews over a mainboard that was like 12 pages long and 10,000 words over a mainboard. Who's going to read it? And I thought it was cool. But some people were reading it, right? But uh, maybe they've, they've been only reading the introduction, the verdict at the end, right? And just skip the, the, the 10 pages in between. But it was just horrible. And it was very technical. And it, as I said, it was dry and boring. So um, what made me change? Um, I got invited to Taiwan, to Taipei in 2002. And this was mainly because um, I'm, I've met um, a vice president of, of VIA. These were the guys who invented this form factor. And I got introduced by a European uh, marketing guy to him. And I asked him before we started our, our little conversation if I can be right in his face and very honest. And I told him for 30 minutes how crappy they are, which was a problem for this European marketing guy because he was, a little, was really getting a little bit scared because I was very, yeah, I was very straight with him. And um, instead of just telling me to fuck off, I'm sorry about that, because he should, should, could have done this, um, he invited me to Taiwan and said, oh, you know what, we need to keep on talking about this. So what, what are you going to do in June? That was in March. I said, oh my God, Richard, I don't even know what I'm going to do in April. Right? So, so in, uh, just leave us, leave us your address. We're going to invite you over to Taiwan. And then I went to Taiwan, and it was absolutely amazing. It was the first time for me in Asia. I saw this crazy city, which was kind of like a science fiction movie, and compare, uh, uh, combined with this um, traditional Asian culture. And after 60 minutes, I said, okay, sooner or later, you're gonna live here. Right? I already made my decision, which wasn't a rational one at all. And um, so I got back to Germany again. And in 2006, in August, I already had two tickets to go to Taiwan. And uh, well, I, I got a round trip just in case, right? Um, I had a, a bunch of apartments to take a look at in Taipei because I really wanted to live in Taiwan right now. And uh, then I got an offer of found investors in Boston and um, I've built tablet PCs for vertical markets at that time. So I went to Boston and then to the US, to Los Angeles for some two years. And I've stumbled upon a couple of people that really, that really changed my life. And, and one of them is over here. Um, that's Robert Scoble. He, he was a former Microsoft blogger. And we met in 2008. And I was absolutely impressed by the way he approached total newbies, right? Because I, I've been running a website with only a thousand visitors at that time. And I told him about my idea and I told him about Taiwan and he, he really loved it. And he, he started to feature me. Whenever he was talking about mobile or embedded systems or small form factors, um, he was referring to me, which builds up a huge momentum. I mean, this guy has on Google Plus like a million followers and on, on Twitter, like 200 or 300,000. So whenever he featured you, immediately in 24 hours, he had another two or 3,000 followers right away. And then he, he wasn't only featuring you on your, on, your, on your Twitter. Whenever I'm bumping into him, he wants to do an interview right away and asking me about uh, any changes in technologies. And then the next day, you're somewhere on Business Insider with this. Right? And you, you don't know how this happened. Well, actually, I do know because he made the interview with me, of course. So Robert definitely changed changed my perspective on how to reach out to the community and also to the public. And he definitely, he definitely told me and taught me how to, how to create reach by using all the tools that are out there, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or Google+. And this is basically because he is creating interesting content. So his idea is just that he's constantly on the search for the next big thing. He just wants to cover new cool technology, and that's basically what I'm doing too. Do you know this guy? This is Gary Vaynerchuk. I've met Gary also in 2008 in January 
uh, at CES um, on a panel. The panel was called Blogging uh, During the Financial Crisis, which was kind of interesting. Um, so Gary is running, is running a, a wine blog. It's called Wine Library TV. There you go. It's, it's a weekly show for about 60 minutes, 60 to 90 minutes. And he's a punk in front of the camera. I mean, wine? That's a pretty serious topic, isn't it, right? But this guy is just really kicking it. It's so much fun to watch it. He knows each and every wine. He's the best expert in wines in the world. And he's running this blog, Wine Library TV and this show. And he also, he also wrote a book that's called Crush It. And I can only recommend you to this one. I'm not having any affiliates with this or any affiliate. I'm not making money out of it. But it's definitely a book worth reading that tells you a little bit about, about Gary's story and how he kind of built a little wine empire. He was working in his, in his parents' wine shop in New York. And now out of a sudden, he's getting, not out of a sudden, but it took him some years, right? And now he's getting invited by all the major companies um, in this industry just to kind of have motivational speeches and talking about, his, talking about his story and talking about his passion. And it's interesting, Gary told me once, I'm getting roughly around 700 emails a day from readers and I try to answer each and every one of it. So just saying, you know, and if you only reply with two sentences, right, there's so many people out there sending you an email because they want to reach out uh, to you and they're taking lots of time to ask you a question. So could you please at least reply to them, tell them, okay, refer to a link or whatever, so that they kind of get this feeling that you care for them. And that's very, very important. So after, after I've, cons I've met all these guys and considered everything, what to change about my goddamn boring blog and that I shouldn't write about these boring main boards anymore, but I mean, who cares about a motherboard, right? Just maybe the manufacturers, but not the average user. I completely changed it. I moved to Taiwan in February 2009, um, founded a company over there. It was just me at the beginning, and I had my co-founder, Nicole, who came from the US, and she started with me the, uh, the English side of it. And now we have we had a team of 10, so we will be here on the IFA show floor with nine people right now. We're going to do live streams from IFA for the first time here in Europe. And um, definitely my whole life changed because I've been embracing these ideas and these experiences from these fellows who are very, very uh, successful in what they are doing. And just to give you an idea, um, well, Netbook News, all over its network is kind of getting, together with YouTube, roughly around 150 to 200,000 visitors a day. And uh, we just signed for our videos with Revision 3, which is the uh, biggest tech web TV network in the world. They just got bought by Discovery Channel. Um, we just signed uh, with ProSieben, Sat1, which is the biggest German private TV. Uh, we are going to launch a show with them in Q4. And I'm producing uh, for the second German TV channel for the Economy magazine. I'm producing uh, a monthly show about technology from Taiwan. This wasn't because I was doing this boring website. Right? This was just about thinking a little bit outside of the box and not doing a, a boring blog. This was about also somehow being, again, being very straightforward. I thought, you know, t writing about technology should be fun. And it should be fun for the readers to read it. Right? And that's why I'm also writing, like every three weeks, I have to write a rant. And I need to be, I need to be angry about a couple of things, just to, just to get it out. I mean, it's still fun, right? I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about this industry, and I'm passionate about what I'm doing. So, um, due to this change, I'm having like 20 or 30 speeches a year about how, how the industry is evolving, what's happening in mobile, and this is happening on three continents. I'm constantly getting invited, which is really cool. Unfortunately, not all of them are paying. I make crazy faces at presentations, 
That's not the only one. There are a bunch of them. Um, I meet cool people. That's Guy Kawasaki, also blogger and author, former Apple employee. Um, I'm getting interviewed by cool chicks, which is kind of nice. That was during CES in, in January. I can even post pictures of me drinking on my Facebook wall without losing any reputation. It can't get any better than this. That was actually my main goal to achieve. And I'm getting interviewed by mainstream media. And you know, I'm, it, it's not about me being, being, in, being in the mainstream media. Oh, exactly, it's the same cap. I'm sorry, I have a bunch of New York Yankee caps. Um, it's not only about me being in, in, uh, on a second German TV channel on the, on, on the prime media or uh, prime news show. It's about this here, which says blogger. I'm not any journalist or expert or whatever, because I'm constantly telling people that I'm a blogger. And I think people can be proud of it uh, when you're calling yourself a blogger, because blogging is a completely new way of distributing media. And therefore, I'm, I think that was, that was definitely a highlight of this year. I mean, ZDF Heute, that's, that's the second biggest German news show, I think, right? And just to have someone getting named blogger, I think that's pretty cool, especially for boring Germany. Plus, I even have a hater group on Facebook. It can't get any better. It's an indicator for success. The more haters you're getting, the more successful and more popular you are. So I have a hater group of about 400 or 500 people right now that are constantly ripping apart each and every content, especially when I have special comments or rant, especially about Apple. Sorry about that. So um, yeah, it's, it's definitely pretty cool to have your own little hater group. Uh, and, it, and it works all the time. You know, just leave a comment in your hater group while they go, they're going wild. So and here, here again, um, all my all my information where you can follow me on Google Plus and on Facebook and on Twitter and whatever. And that's about it. And I thought I wanted to go through this as soon as possible. So we have plenty of times to do Q uh, Q&A. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you. So if you guys have any questions, oh yeah, sure. Why did you pick Taiwan and not another country like South Korea? What is for you special about living in Asia and this technology um, atmosphere? Well, I've been living in the US for three years. And the US is uh, almost like Germany uh, with, lo with longer opening hours for the shops. But so basically it was still, um, it, I, got, I got bought in the US. But it was, it was good for me to, to get in, to get in contact with all these US bloggers and to also learn from them a good portion of pragmatism, which is in my opinion also very important. Um, I've picked Taiwan, well first of all, I fell in love with it in, in 2001 or 2002, the first time I got over there. Plus you have to keep in mind that 80% of the stuff that you're using right now is whether designed in Taiwan or built by a Taiwanese company. So. They, they rule 80% of the PC hardware market and also the tablet market because uh, Foxconn is Hanho uh, Corporation, which is at the end a Taiwanese company, even though that they are producing in China. So where we live in, ta uh, in Taipei, I can reach out to each and every headquarter, 80% of the global market in 15 minutes. And the difference is, for example, if I would still live in Germany and I so wanted to meet maybe someone at Siemens or BMW. Well, try to head over to the headquarters, tell them, I'm sorry, I'm a blogger, I want to, I want to talk to someone from the marketing, right? They will, they will look at you like you're coming from Mars. In Taiwan, they will immediately have time for you. And, and this is also something that's happening in the US, right? Um, Taiwan is very important for us because we are in, um, in the heart of the industry. Plus we have this advantage of the time zone. So we're six hours ahead. And I can switch off my computer at 7 or 8 in the evening, because what shall happen? These guys also have to leave their office somehow, right? And therefore, it's Taiwan. And it's a beautiful island. People are unbelievable friendly. Um, when, I'm, when I'm driving to the south, it takes me three hours. You're on the same latitude as Hawaii. So you have all these Polynesian uh, beaches over there. It's just perfect. Tech and beach and jungle. 
typhoons, earthquakes. It's exciting. Hello, Sasha. Uh, I would like to ask you how how long uh, did it take you before you got um, somehow popular, so to speak? Uh, how much content did you did you make? Can you somehow describe your curve? When when was the tipping point? Thanks. Basically, it started in 2001. Um, when I thought, okay, you know what, you have you have to write about technology right now. But that was this boring website. So in, for about six years, I've been in this bubble of boredom, completely trapped. And then it just started to change as soon as I moved over to the US. And as soon as I got in contact with real bloggers and not someone who tries to copy corporate media. It took me a couple of years, and I also was too arrogant and ignorant. Right? I thought, what, blogging? What's that? Right? I'm, a, I'm, I'm the one who's running the news here in this technology field, right? but I wasn't. It was just goddamn boring. It took me a while, but it really took off, um, I would say, 2008. And then, since then, it got multiplied each and every year. Right? And so, uh, but again, you constantly have to work on it. Uh, you just can't. I'm always saying my day has 48 hours and I need 72. That, 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 that pretty much sums it up, right? But, but it's not a job. That's my life. It's a lifestyle for me. And blogging is a lifestyle, definitely. Did you take any courses in yeah, enjoyable writing or something, or are you a natural talent? That sounds very arrogant again. If you're saying anything like this on the US panel, they're going to fucking laugh their ass off. And that's also a difference between Europe and the US. It's, it, it's not about being overconfident, not at all. It's just about figuring out where you're good at. Right? I think there are a couple of... There are a couple of things that you can't really learn. Of course, the more you're writing, the more you're getting into it, the better you are, right? And how to build up your... You know what's working. You know where people click, and you know what kicks their asses. Um, it's 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 a try and error principle. So I, I I never took any classes on writing or whatever, and that's why I'm still I'm not a journalist. I'm a blogger. Uh, first, thank you for interesting speech. I wanted to ask, uh, how do you motivate uh, yourself to update your blog? Uh, Regularly, is it about strict time management, or you have to look all the time for new inspirations? Thank you. Mm. The biggest challenge with tech blogging is you always try to be ahead of all the other guys, and there's so much happening in this field. I mean, we write about mobile technology, and um, that's the most dynamic IT market in the world. So. The huge advantage is that we have this time zone advantage, that we're six hours ahead, right? So when, when, when the guys in Europe are still sleeping, or in the US are going to bed, right, we're getting up at eight in the morning or nine in the morning, and I know what's going on. And so we can block and schedule it. At the beginning, yes, when I was on my own, I've had days where, where I did like 15 or 20 articles. 15 or 20 articles is a 16, 17, 18 hours day. And now we have um, one, two, three, four, five, six. We have about seven bloggers on three continents. So we can cover the whole time zones, which really helps. But you constantly have to look for new interesting content, definitely. That's very important. Thank you. Well, thanks for the talk. Um, speaking of boring blogs, what would you say is your main advice uh, to bloggers uh, f to make an interesting story, to make an interesting blog post? Is it the story or is it uh, tone of voice? Is it the time advantage? <laughs> what's what's the, your advice to have a very like um, interesting and, and, and good blog post that keeps people in your blog and keeps people reading? I think it would be boring if I would, uh, boring if I would just tell you be different, right? Because, I mean, what's that? That's, that's, that's not a real answer to this, even though that I said it even in my presentation. Sorry about that. Um, 
Don't be afraid of making mistakes. Try out new things. This is a... Uh, Germans are very paranoid in making mistakes, especially when they're going public. Because what other Germans, what other German readers love to do is leaving comments and telling you how mistaken you were. Right? They just love to do this. But anyways, also this creates buzz, right? You have a, you have a bunch of comments of 20 people telling you, the, uh, telling you the same. You misspelled this three words over there. Right? You have all these yeah, spelling Nazis on your blog right away. Um, don't be afraid of this. Don't be afraid to attack things personally. Um, when I started to write my very first rants about um, journalists on Spiegel or Welt because, uh, because they've been writing bullshit articles, um, the president of the German journalist uh, agency or community or whatever this is called uh, wrote me an email saying, you're not doing this with your colleagues. It's like, why not? What's the problem with it? I mean, you can see it in, your, in our parliaments for hundreds of years, right? They're personally going after uh, other opinions. I think that's very, very important also to position yourself due to this. If you think you're right, and if you also have the facts and the arguments, why not saying this? Call them out. It's better, it's, it's, it's kind of, it kind of helps to filter all this bullshit out of the internet, right? There always needs to be a, a, a different opinion. So don't be afraid um, uh, of this. Don't be afraid of being very, very public. And don't be afraid um, of doing mistakes. And I think that that's... That's the biggest obstacles, uh, obstacle for a lot of bloggers, that they are afraid of making mistakes because they're constantly facing criticism. But if you're going public, you have to face criticism. Hey, Sasha. Um, it's great to see you here with so much enthusiasm. I was wondering when I, when I saw those pictures of yours meeting influential people, I think it's something a lot of people, not only bloggers, but maybe entrepreneurs, startups, they dream, this their dream, they come to a conference, they meet some guru, and they say, oh, he kind of liked me, we had a good conversation. That very evening, he's featuring them, and next day, their followers, their n number of followers explodes. Um, so I was wondering if you can gauge that, how much of the, the success of being a blogger, being any entrepreneur, not, not, let's say with a blog, how much of, of the success of a blogger is having a sharp blog, being interesting, and how much of that is personal, classical networking and meeting the right people at the right time? Thank you, that's a very good question, by the way. Um, it is important to do networking. We are roughly traveling around six months a year. So that's like 200,000 miles. And I'm constantly going to conferences because I want to meet these guys again. I couldn't get it at the beginning. And when I stumbled upon um, Scobo for the first time in 2008, and he did an interview with me uh, in Las Vegas, and I, I was so going after Sony, and, and I'm told into his camera for 10 minutes what kind of crappy company Sony is. And the next morning, I opened up my inbox and I had like five job offers, 80 emails from Sony fanboys wanted to figure out where I'm living. And um, I looked up this interview on his, on, on his video page and it had like 180,000 views. I said, oh, wow. That's, that's neat. And I got, of course, each and every day, like three, 400 new Twitter followers. It helps you to kickstart this, right? But if you, can't, if you can't contribute interesting content, these guys will switch over to the next account, you know, and they will, they will, follow, uh, they will follow another person right away. So I think it's a combination of this. If you have cool content and no one is reading it and no one is engaging, right, it's a problem that you can't network in the proper way. So you need to find your pretty own, or very own multiplicators in your niche. That's very, very important. So yeah, and, it, and it's, even, uh, it's even important for entrepreneurs. I mean, we're still entrepreneurs, right? We're still running a startup, even though that I'm doing this already for almost 11 years now. I still call myself a startup person because it's constantly changing. I don't know what's gonna happen in a week. Well, I have to launch a new site. I, I, 
is it going to be successful? Hell, of course it's going to be successful because I'm working my ass off for this. And I know that we have cool content. And I will let all these other guys know again that we have a fantastic website and you need to head over there and you definitely want to retweet it and like it and tell all your other followers about it. So once again, it's not about being overconfident. If you have something cool, then let other people know. Right? And if you don't have a lot of followers, then make sure that you're reaching out to other people that are also getting that you have cool content because you know, these guys are going to become a multiplicator. If you have something cool, they are happy to feature you. They are happy to support you. And you, know, you, you, can, you can always call him. He, he even put his, uh, his, his mobile phone number on Twitter to a million followers or what. And people are calling him, so it happens. All right. Hi. Hi, Sasha. Long time no see. Uh, one of the things to your question is actually work backstage. Don't try to get to the rock star directly because that currently is what everybody is doing. I had the benefit of meeting Scoble in 2005, so I'm currently, as you as well, are in his list of like 250 bloggers around the world. It's a list he just curated, but every time he tweets that out or gives it out on Google+, Plus, I can attribute, I would say, at least 15,000 of my Google+, Plus followers from that. He tweeted that, that, but if you go to him today or something, somebody similar today, everybody wants to get to them. So you need to be there early on and you need to be there at an early point. And if you're like today, you have your rock star on stage, don't go for the rock star, go for the backstage people. Because those guys are paying attention to the other people who are surrounding. And if somebody crops up, writes intelligent stuff, you can be noticed. You also can be very much noticed for comments. I have it frequently. I intentionally write, I'm Nicole, I'm from Germany, I have a European view. And I get comments and I get requests from people like, you're one of those females and you write tech stuff. Just like, who are you? What are you doing? I've had interview requests from having comments on some blog of American people because I position myself and I actually have a session afterwards for tactics, how to get noticed, so a little plug if you want to stay. <laughs> Hello. Um, I was wondering if there's a difference between uh, German, uh, the, the German audience and the, the US audience on, on the blogs? <laughs> That's a pretty good question. And thank you, Nicole. I know Nicole for almost four years. She's my co-founder. Why, why aren't you asking me those questions when we're sitting in the office? <laughs> um, there's a huge difference. Yeah, definitely. Um, German readers that are getting you wrong tend to become jealous when you're successful with something. They love to criticize. They love to leave comments on your English videos that you have a weird German accent, which is rarely happening, barely happening with US commenters, which is kind of interesting. It's actually the other way around, especially with gay people, because they love my accent then. Um, I think German, German readers and German con uh, um, commenters and the German audience isn't so forgiving as the US one. Um, the US guys are more looking at your content and that you're different and that this is something that I've never seen before. Uh, or maybe not, not, not in this way, while the Germans are trying to find your mistakes, like we've already had this dis uh, discussion before, um, they try to figure out, I said, oh, see, he pronounced this name of this manufacturer wrong again. Then you have like 10 comments on this video, and then you have to explain them, I'm sorry, you're talking out of your fucking rear. Because it's a Taiwanese company, I live in Taiwan, I know how to fucking pronounce it. Right? So, but, but that's happening in Germany, and then you have an argument over a hundred comments and they're still not getting it. Right? They, 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 they know that they have to pronounce it that way, and they're going to let you know. Um, as soon as, as you're calling them out, as you're... My, I have all these trolls on the blog that really hate me, and I love to play, I, I'm trolling back, that's no problem, it's the same with stalkers, just stalk back. Um, 
they're, they're taking it very, very personal. They're going after you. They're going after you in a way that they're creating own watch blocks for you. Um, they're coming up with Goodwin's Law. Just look it up on Wikipedia and then you know what it is. Um, it is, uh, they love to criticize. But on the other hand, the German readers that are really following you through all this process, I, I, I still have readers on my blog that came to my very first blog when I had like 200 readers a day. And they've been following this whole process and they're, and they're sending you emails for your birthday, they're sending you emails when you've been on TV or on a radio uh, some, somewhere, and they're telling you, hey, that's so cool, I'm one of your first readers, I'm one of your first followers on Twitter. So as soon as you really build up a strong followership, this helps a lot. In the US, it's easier. Maybe it's also more superficial. In Germany, it's really hard to kind of reach this break-even point where you have a huge and strong followership, but then, you know, they're very supportive, but you will always have these assholes.